Good morning. I trust you're doing well on this beautiful mid-August day. And it's a beautiful mid-August day, at least in Springfield. And I hope you're having a good week. Blessed. I hope God's put you in contact with some people who need uh, the message of the gospel. And uh, you have been able to take advantage of all of that. Somebody's going to have to start putting a beeper on me to put my microphone where it needs to be when I when I start. Um, here we go. Uh, I want to begin today just a little bit different. I want to start with prayer. And I may do this going forward because I, I want it to be on the front end that we're making an appeal that the, the Word of God would fall on good ground. And I think that's I think that's important. So let me pray to that end today. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your goodness, your mercy, your blessing. It's been a good day. I've enjoyed my time with you already this morning. Thank you for the privilege of spending personal devotional time with you uh, each day. And uh, we fellowship together. And uh, there's nothing quite like that in those few minutes that uh, we spend together. Thank you. I ask you today, Lord, that your word would be uh, clear that it would fall on good ground. Somebody that's seeking truth, somebody that's looking for answers to their questions, let it be, O oh God, that I am uh, clear in my thinking, that I have liberty of speech to convey the message of God. I further pray that you give us complete direction regarding uh, Springfield Calvary's relocation, and uh, that uh, not only that, you provide the financial resources to do the things that need to be done in that purchase and also in uh, any changes in the property that might need to be done. I pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people somewhere, everywhere, say amen. And um, I am grateful for all that the Lord is doing. Uh, let me remind you that... Um, Questions are welcome as I teach. I will attempt to, particularly as I'm going expositionally through the book of Acts, and really I say particularly, but I try to apply that all of the time, that I keep the scripture in context. So uh, if you read everything around, if you read the entire chapter, if you read the entire book, it won't change the message that is being uh, conveyed. I am not presumptuous. I don't feel that I have all of the answers. I have been studying the book of Acts uh, for 35 years, and what I am sharing with you in many ways is the culmination of all of that because I've worked to keep pretty good notes and, and the, the such like. Uh, some continue to be interested in, in assisting at uh, Springfield Calvary and springfieldcalvary.church, upper right-hand corner, is the place to make a contribution to our building fund. Uh, when we look at the book of Acts, let me remind you, number one, it is originally addressed to a gentleman by the name of Theophilus, just as the book of Luke in the Old Testament, or in the Gospels is. And uh, Theophilus, by all accounts, was a, was a uh, Roman official. And uh, he in all likelihood, was a governor of some sort. We're not sure where that he actually worked or, or whatever, but he was a person of some significance in, in all of that. So Luke is writing to this person who uh, has some knowledge of the things of God. He is, to some degree, familiar with Judaism, but there is no indication that he was a that he was a convert. So uh, there are things that Luke takes time, I feel, to explain because of who his original reader was. Okay, the second thing I would remind you is that Acts chapter one is a uh, transitional chapter. You read again about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and the promise of the Father and what it was that the disciples were to do, okay? And then when we get to Acts chapter 2, it is a, uh, it's what I've called a hinge chapter. That means it opens the door to a new era of God dealing with his people in a particular way. What we discover in Acts chapter 2 
is built on the foundation of everything that precedes it. But it is a better thing. We don't have the option of going back and saying, well, I choose Mosaic law as my approach to having a relationship with God, or I, uh, I will take the season of innocence that would have been the Garden of Eden. We don't have that as an option. We are living in this time of the church, of the outpouring of the Spirit, and so it is a hinge that opens the door. And it opens the door, number one, to the outpouring of the Spirit. Number two, it opens the door to many Jews who were in Jerusalem coming to a revelation that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, the anointed one that had been promised throughout the Old Testament. It introduces us to uh, the preaching of the gospel. Uh, in his message, we're going to see that that Peter brings us to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It introduces us to the reality of people being convicted about their sinful condition, and it brings us to a response as to what they were to do about their sinful condition. So it is this hinge chapter, and so we have uh, everything that's before as a foundation, then we get here and we open up a new era. It is the beginning of something new. I was going to read uh, to you all of Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that today. There's several things I want to talk with you about. So Peter stands up with the eleven. He lifts up his voice. He says to, uh, he says to them, These are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it's just nine o'clock in the morning, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And he uh, continues with a citation that is found in Joel chapter 2. We talked about that yesterday. We talked about who Joel was and the great issues that, that Joel's uh, ministry dealt with. The first thing that I want to have you notice today is how Peter begins his discourse after he has given rebuttal to those who were mocking. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, we've looked at that from one angle. Let's look at it from another. Paul begins, uh, Peter, excuse me, begins his appeal using the Bible. It does several things. Number one, these people have been asking questions. Number two, some have been mocking. They're looking at each other with confusion. But now he takes them back to Old Testament scripture and he immediately lifts their minds to something beyond what was happening in the streets of Jerusalem. Their view, their perception, their perspective had to change just a little bit because it wasn't just what was in front of them. But instead, now he was going to ask them to filter what they were seeing through the Word of God. The second thing that I think builds on that is that his explanation is based on divine authority. Peter did not say, I think. Instead, he referenced an authority that this group already trusted. Uh, notice that in, in all of his preaching, and, and nor here, Peter does not at any time cite something that Jesus had said during his time while he was God manifest in flesh. The reason at this point, this audience did not perceive Jesus to be the authority. So he takes it back to Joel, who they did perceive to be the authority. Again, you notice Peter is establishing this communication on common ground. It is not as though he is uh, an attorney in an adversarial relationship. Instead, he finds that which they can agree on together. Joel was a prophet. 
And what he cites is things that they agree that Joel said. The difference now is that Peter is going to use that which Joel said to explain what's happening before them. By quoting the scripture, Peter allowed the Holy Ghost to do the talking. So how did the Holy Ghost do the talking? He was speaking through all of these folks as they were speaking in these foreign languages. Well, what Joel had written was inspired of the Spirit is the way that Peter would later describe it. They didn't speak as they were uh, from themselves, but as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. There's an important premise here, and it is the authority is in the Word of God. The authority is not in my comments about the Word of God. The authority is in the Word of God. The Lord will back up His Word. He won't always back up what Carlton says about His Word. Hopefully, I know the difference. This goes to uh, another issue, and that is... I, Years ago, I did some study in regard to pastoral counseling, and uh, I wanted to be as effective as I could be as a pastor, and I run up on the writings of a gentleman by the name of Jay Adams, and he's a doctor, psychologist, psychiatrist, something to that degree. I read a number of his books, and uh, one of the books is Competent to Counsel, and he kind of introduces us to his concept of the way counseling should be, and he's coming at this from a Christian biblical perspective. And he affirms what I have just mentioned, that the authority is in the Word of God. And he said that as a pastor or as a counselor, if I'm going to be a Bible-based counselor, when someone comes to me with an issue of life, when someone comes with a question, if I, as a pastor, say, I think, then my response to their question is human wisdom or human knowledge. But if the response to that question is the Bible says, or what does the Bible say, and then take that person to the scripture or help them find the scripture. And at times I've uh, been in this situation and I've opened the Bible and I handed it over to someone and said to them, read this for us. Read it aloud for us. Because when, when we look at what the Bible says, then we have the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and we have all of the authority that is behind it. Does, does that make sense that we need the authority of the Word of God in answering last question? So look for Bible answers, not Carlton Kuhn answers, not church father answers, not denominational answers, not even heritage truths. Heritage truths are things that have been part of one's life. It's been part of their way of thinking. It's been part of their family for so long that they are accepted without consideration. They're accepted without question. They're accepted without there being any personal, I did it for myself, biblical research or mental challenge to the heritage that is really an assumption. What if those whose heritage we exist within, what if they got it wrong? And there are many things that we do get wrong. Peter quotes Joel quotes Joel he quotes the scripture I want to be a man of the word of God I want those that I am privileged to pastor even those who are part of what I've come to Calvary call Calvary on I want Calvary online I want you to be people of the word of God because that's where the answer is that's where the authority is particularly when we use that scripture within context. Now, if a person just draws out an answer and you read everything around it and suddenly the answer they provided doesn't make a bit of sense, then that person has misused or abused the scripture. So 
I, I guess I need to offer that as a caveat. Okay, so Peter quotes Joel. There's an interesting sidebar here, and it's this, that it may be that Joel's prophecy goes all the way back to a prayer that was made by Moses. And there was a time when Israel had gone through a difficult time, and there had come a touch of God, and there had come an anointing, and Aaron came to Moses and said, there's folks out here prophesying, and uh, we need to shut all of that down. And Moses, being wise leader, understanding the value of any person's deeper connection and availability to God, said that would that all God's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Joel, he later prophesies that, he later declares that God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh and that there are going to be prophecies. Okay, second sidebar. I wonder if Peter might have thought to himself, why are you folks shocked and baffled by there being something remarkable happening in the streets of Jerusalem? Now, being fair to both Peter and to the multitude gathered there that day, I don't know that I would have uh, immediately said, boy, this is, this is God fulfilling Joel chapter 2. I probably would have needed the explanation as well. But for those who mocked, and even for those who were just uncertain, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, might it not have been that they would say, you know, this sure is odd, but that's our God. He does things different. It's not odd, it's God. He, he, he just acts in a way that is remarkable because this was certainly an odd event that was happening. Okay, so he says to them, Citing Joel, in the last days, saith God, Joel, as we're going to see in just a minute, he begins his prophecy with the word afterwards. And if you'll remember our little review yesterday, uh, the afterwards that he is referencing here is in the previous verses in Joel chapter 2, he has talked about God visiting Israel. And this is a reference to God manifest in flesh, fully God, fully man, God incarnate. So in Joel's thinking or in Joel's anointed presentation, he says, okay, this has happened afterwards, afterwards. And then he talks about the outpouring of the Spirit. Peter the afterwards has already been completed. God manifest in flesh already visited Israel. There is no need to talk about that part of it. No need to even connect. But instead, he just goes to in the last days, which is a little different. This particular statement and what we're going to read here brings to light some interesting aspects of Bible prophecy. Now, when I talk about Bible prophecy here, I'm not necessarily talking about end of the age prophecy, though there is some of this, there is some end of the age stuff in uh, this passage of Scripture, but I'm not necessarily uh, referring to that. The first thing that you will see here is that God's way of looking at time is different than mine. If we had a mutual friend who was uh, terminally ill, and I ran into you at some event, and I said, how's Tom doing? And uh, your response, well, Tom is in his last days. I would imagine that he is on his deathbed 
and uh, not long hence I will hear that he has passed away in the last days that's what Joel's or that's what Peter says in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh we have to remember that God looks at time different than we number one with the Lord a thousand years is as a day the second thing is this and this is important in prophecy and this the, the reason it's important is it saves confusion and uh, we don't let ourselves get caught up or we don't become baffled over something that when you look at it you say well now that doesn't make sense that doesn't all compute which could be the case here if we were to read all of this passage of scripture and we were to say, okay, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. That's what's happening here. And then later we read there will be uh, blood, fire, vapors of smoke and all of the other things that are going to happen before that great and notable day of the Lord come. We don't want to be confused by that. So here's the thing that we need to know about scripture prophecy. It, at various places, and this happens pretty often, there is what could be called a dual fulfillment. And so a prophet makes a statement, and in 30 or 50 or 70 years, what he said comes to pass. But it does not come to pass in completeness there may be some aspects of it that are not yet totally complete let me give you an example um, the scripture talks about the abomination of desolation it talks about the antichrist coming to uh, jerusalem and wanting the israelites to worship him as god and and uh, that he is going to uh, make the temple desolate by having put an abomination there. An abomination would be anything that would render the temple unholy. Okay, so abomination is an act or behavior that makes the temple unholy. When the temple is unholy, it becomes desolate because no ministry can happen there until the temple has been appropriately cleansed and that was a significant process for Israel so scripture talks about this happening in 168 BC a Greek king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes of course the Greeks were rulers of <clears throat> of all of Israel and Antiochus Epiphanes was unhappy with the Israelites. They would not fully submit to his rule. He brought an army to Jerusalem, came to the temple, and he put up a he put up a statue of Zeus in the temple. Well, now that's a no-no among the Israelites. That's an idol, so you, you couldn't have that. He's not done. Antiochus Epiphanes takes a pig, goes inside the holy place of the temple, and he sacrifices that pig on the altar of incense. And of course, this uh, was an abomination of worship this was an abomination of the holy place of Israel this was and so there was a desolation that was brought Antiochus Epiphanes did that in 168 BC it is a foreshadowing of what the Antichrist is going to do when he comes to Jerusalem and says you're going to worship me as God and he sets himself up in a temple a temple by the way yet to be erected in Jerusalem he puts himself in that temple and says you're going to worship me as God and the Israelites of course the Hebrews the Jews they reject all of that so do you see there is this 
parallel. There is Antiochus Epiphanes. He, and I don't remember which Old Testament writer, I believe it's Ezekiel that addresses this, the abomination, but Antiochus Epiphanes fulfills it in part. He foreshadows some of the things that the Antichrist are going to do, but he is not the full, there is a dual prophecy here, and part of it is complete. Yet there is that which remains, and in what remains, uh, there will be kind of a repeat of what Antiochus Epiphanes did. So in Joel, cited by Peter here, Joel didn't know it. Peter may well not have known. But we have the same thing. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And then later in the paragraph, we read of blood, fire, vapor of smoke. And those have not yet come to pass. But they will. So, when we begin to talk about the last days, realize that the last days is a continuation. We live in the last days, but the last days didn't start at the end of World War II or at the end of conflict in Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan or anywhere else. The last days began on the day of Pentecost with the outpouring of the Spirit. Notice what Peter does not say. He does not say to his audience in this day, this is kind of what Jesus said when he took the scroll and read from Isaiah and then put it down. He said, in this day it's, it's fulfilled before you. Peter didn't say that. He didn't say this is the fulfillment of that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Because that would have indicated a completion of, that this was a done deal, that it was over. It's not over. It wasn't over that day. It wasn't over 30 years later. It wasn't over 300 years later. It's not over 2,000 years later. There's going to be more. Number one, more going to be filled with the Spirit. And then of the things that he writes about in the latter part, there will be blood, fire, vapor of smoke, and these will come in this same era of time that are denoted as last days. So the time span between what is spoken of in verse 17 and verse 19 to this point has been almost 2,000 years. So the last days encompass the launching of the church and goes to the completion of the day of the Lord. So the day of Pentecost, one way of looking at it is this. The uh, day of Pentecost was a single feast day for Israel, but this particular day of Pentecost, and really with the coming of Christ and now the outpouring of the Spirit, there remaineth no need to have any of those. Passover, Pentecost, Day of Atonement, any of those things. And uh, conservative Judaism, Matter of fact, some that's not so conservative, they continue to have those events, those feasts, those times of sacrifice or times of celebration. But they are all complete in Christ. So to look at it, perhaps as we should, this day of Pentecost that we're reading about in Acts chapter 2 was the last day of Pentecost that was actually needed. It has no time limit. It continues even now. If you have any questions about the dual use of prophecy or other places that that comes into play, if you'll send me a note, I'll do my best to uh, respond to that. I do appreciate uh, our viewers, appreciate the occasional question that I get. The Holy Ghost is still being poured out. If you do not yet have the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance, I invite you where you are, whatever you're doing today and over the next days, 
that you make yourself available through repentance to the Spirit of the Lord. You let Him touch your life, not just touch your life, you let Him come in and fill you with His Spirit. Again, if you'd like to help SpringfieldCalvary.Church, you can do so. If you're interested in any of my books, CarltonCoonSenior.com, including a course on disciple-making that my son and I put together to help local church leaders, pastors, develop a strong disciple-making program. All of my discipleship training stuff is there, all of my own Bible studies, and you can actually order uh, my next book, which is in pre-release, in order to discount um, its selling and getting great reviews. So, you know, who knows? That's what a lot, an author likes to hear. I guess I should give you the name and uh, the premise of the book. Uh, the name of the book is Bad Decisions, The Legacy of Lot. And uh, the premise is this, that... Um, Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, and we should and we do. Remember, she is the one who turned her back, looked back to Sodom, and because of her disobedience to the instruction of the Lord's angels, she became a pillar of salt. But the premise of the book is that we don't know anything about Lot's wife. We know of one decision she made that was a bad decision. But... Everything that she did, that one decision, is built on a platform of Lot's lifetime of bad decisions. Lot set his wife and his children up for utter, total failure. And I take what is a negative and try to turn it into a positive lesson to us that we need to make good decisions and let that be our legacy. So if you're interested in that, uh, take a look at it, CarltonCoonSenior.com. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Bless your people today. Let there be revival in the land, not just in our city, although we pray specifically for this place. Hoki Shabahashima Dodobokute the honest and sincere. Reach them with the power of your spirit, I pray. Do it as only you can. In Jesus' name, we do all that we can do, but God, now it depends on you. In your name, amen. Have a great day. Give God the glory and the praise. Be a man, woman of worship. Amen.